Anya Highmarch is a mother of five, stepmother, entrepreneur, and globally renowned businesswoman. Having set up her business when she was just 18, she shares the lessons learned along the way, successes and failures, and why washing your hair is almost always the answer. And so there's a whole system to it, which is just actually being taught in the right way. So uh, I think we shouldn't use the words control freak. I think we should call ourselves organisational legends. That's, that's how we're going to reframe it. I call him my harshest critic, because if I ask advice from him, it will always be quite tough, but absolutely unvarnished advice, which is actually the most useful advice, honestly. Uh, well, I mean, I have to say, don't I? Um, you know, wash your hair. Anya, first up, I want to say... Thank you for coming on this pod. I feel like you're doing me a massive favor and that this might well be your worst nightmare because you're such a private person usually. So I just want, I just want to say thank you in advance. Is, okay. is, this, is, is this sort of thing your worst nightmare? Chatting to you on a Friday afternoon? No, not at all. It's a great <laughs> pleasure and an honor. Um, I mean, I am quite a private person, but I think when I wrote the book, I sort of gave that up, didn't I? That's the awful thing. You sort of crossed the, the Rubicon. So I think, um, no, it's lovely to see you. Nice to chat. You're currently operating, many would say, at the top of your game. Is it, is it sort of where you want to be? Are you where you want to be in your life right now? Um, well, in operating at the top of my game, I, I read that as operating at sort of full pelt. Um, so, um, so yes, sometimes I, I would say it's a little unsustainable, actually, my, my pace at the moment. Uh, in terms of do I feel, have I reached my sort of, you know, my, the pinnacle? No, I absolutely don't feel that. I, I worry that if I felt that, that would, would all go really wrong at that point anyway. But no, I, I think that the more you do, the more you actually just feel completely insecure about what you haven't done. And, um, and there's always the next mountain to climb. So, um, and I think that's probably quite a good thing. It'd be really boring if you felt you'd sort of, you'd done it, right? So, no, I, I feel mostly like I've got a very long to-do list. What's at the top of it? Um, well, I suppose um, that moment when you kind of breathe out. <laughs> I'm doing a lot of ex exhaling. It's funny, isn't it? When you go on holiday, the first thing you do, you sit on a sunbed and you sit on the beach and you go, oh, you know, it's the same when you kind of, you know, if you lie on a massage table or you, you, you know, you, you uh, I don't know, sit sometimes on a plane and you kind of made it that far and you sort of do the big exhale. I think exhaling is quite important, actually. Um, and so I guess when you get to that point where, um, you know, the children are happy and maybe they've all got a roof over their heads and that's all kind of good and, you know, you sort of, uh, everything's sort of ticked and tied. But I don't know. I mean, I think I'm, I'm quite sure knowing myself as well as I do now um, that there'll be the next mountain and that's fun. And actually you realise that um, you pick your challenges. I once went to see an acupuncturist who um, I was exhausted and, and I sort of said, I've got this and this and this and this when he asked. And then he went, yeah, but you chose all of that, didn't you? Uh, and it was actually a pretty good <laughs> lesson. Sympathetic. I do choose it. Yeah. Well, it actually, it was I mean, annoyed me at first, but it, it actually made me realize that these are all choices. You know, in the COVID, we didn't do anything. And um, and that was bliss in many ways. But um, it was, you know, I, I've gone back to full belt because I'm curious and I'm excited and I like to do things. And, and I'm a sucker and I'm a people pleaser and all those things that we all are. Um, and maybe I'm ambitious. And um, so actually, they're all choices. So, um, so yes, there's, there's lots to do. Lots of mountains to climb. And, and when there's lots to do and there's lots of mountains to climb, presumably you have to be uber organized about it. And if I think about your brand and the things I personally love about your brand is that it absolutely deals with organization and puts that front and center. I mean, is that is that because that's who you are and what you need in your world? Yeah, it's completely come out of need. I mean, it started actually, so we have a whole shop dedicated to organisation, which we call the label shop. And it, it comes out of the fact that when I was much younger and doing a lot of travelling and when there were all different currencies and we didn't use, um, or when we used currency, um, I used to have these little, um, started off by being little bags, which I would have my dollars in and my yen in and my, you know, Hong Kong dollars in and so on. And then I'd have separate bags for the receipts from the Hong Kong trip and the Japan trip and the American trip. And it was all organised. And, and then I thought, actually, I can do this in a nice away and I started making little leather pouches which one that said dollars and then the other says dollars receipts and then and I just love all that organization because it makes you efficient because it saves time I can then hand that receipts bag to my assistant and kind of say could you do the expenses so it's just um when I could finally afford an assistant in those days but it's just um you know it's a nice way I think that when you feel out of control, it makes you feel a bit more in control. So it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a bit nerdy, um, but, it, but it works. And so organisation has been pivotal, frankly, to me being able to do and juggle all the things that, you know, us women juggle. 
How important is control to you? I was thinking about this regarding myself the other day and wondering if I'm a control freak or not. And I couldn't decide which way I, which, which way I sort of sat on that debate. How, how, do you consider yourself a control freak or not really? Yes, but I see it as a good thing. I've had to kind of relook at that because um, control freak sounds like, you know, you're a nightmare, which I probably am, and, you know, a bit bossy, and I probably am, in all fairness, and a bit controlling, I definitely am. Um, but at the same time, those are kind of organizational skills, which are in turn leadership skills, and which in turn allow you to organize and run businesses, you know, all over the world and, and juggle all the zillions of tasks that come in thrown at you into your inbox, your Instagram, people send you messages on Instagram inviting you to think, it's just like, God, so many inboxes and, and incoming streams to manage. You've got to juggle all of that, plus all the kids, plus all the school dates, plus all the stuff we deal with, um, and somehow get it into a list and, and organize it by priority and get it done, right? I mean, we do an awful lot. And I think women actually have the lion's share mostly, not always, but mostly at home. Um, and so we should not actually um, do ourselves down. I think control freak sounds a bit derogatory. And actually, I think we're legends, frankly, us women, um, for managing all of that stuff um, and actually <laughs> making it happen and not having a complete nervous breakdown too often. Um, so organisation is, is a great thing. And actually, I slightly wish that we had all been taught more at school on best practice forms of organisation. My son, actually, my mm. eldest son is a lawyer. And in his first week at um, Freshfields, where he was working, they actually gave him a training on on best practice management of your inbox. And I was so fascinated by it that I actually contacted the, the, the people who organized it and we actually ran workshops in our label stores. And it was absolutely inundated because actually, you know, you're meant to always have a zero inbox, you know, it's a completely empty inbox. And they teach you how to do it and how to manage it because a lot of people, and me included, um, you know, you, you can stall on things. And so there's a whole system to it, which is just actually being taught in the right way. So uh, I think we shouldn't use the words control freak. I think we should call ourselves organizational legends. That's, that's how we're going to reframe it. I love that. And I've just glanced across at my inbox. Do you want to know how many I've got of, of messages flashing up in that red box? 14,694. <laughs> Send you these people immediately. That, that actually slightly brings me out in hives. So I, I'm a very, I, I mean, I am a nerd. Every Sunday I get to, my kids laugh. I always say I've got to get to the bottom of my inbox. And in fact, they actually made me something that talked about the bottom of her inbox. Um, and um, so I just have to, it's like washing my hair. I have to do that every week to kind of deal with it, file it, move it on. So the idea of having, my husband's like that. I just, I can't, it actually makes me feel, you know, quite like I've got a rash. Um, I feel like I actually manage, have to cancel. Well, no, I feel like I have to cancel that email account. I actually think that the only way to handle that now moving forward would be to start again. And I might have to actually do that because it is, as you say, it's, it's like a tidy mind, a tidy life, all of those sort of sayings that fit into that way of thinking. I feel like I am losing control because of that inbox and it, I, I need to address it. Yeah, but, but right. I need people to, who have sent you requests or loving messages or thank yous or yes, you're just going to bin all those messages. I mean, that feels a little bit mean. <laughs> I don't I like know, that policy. I know. That, well, why do you think it's got 14,000 in there? It's because I can't bring myself to delete the inbox yet. <laughs> my father anyway, once that, said that he actually wants but just to say, my father once said that there was a point where he felt so overwhelmed by his inbox, he put the whole thing in the bin when it was a physical inbox because he said, anything important will come back to me. It's always sort of sat with me, that, that thought, which is true. I'm, I'm, I'm there waiting for the, the message to come in. I bat it back immediately. I'm like so, I mean, it's stupid because, of course, the more you do and the more you behave like that, the more incoming you get. Um, sometimes you're better if you don't answer. Unfortunately, if you don't answer things, people don't often ask twice, which is, but I'm too polite. I'm annoyingly polite. Yes, quite right. And that's, the right you, you that's the right way to be. Um, I want to ask you about what it takes to become and be an entrepreneur. Is it instinctive or, or can it be taught? Because it's one of those things that many people have an idea and, and want to then see it into sort of a, a reality, but it doesn't always happen like that. So how, how does a light bulb moment become a reality? What are the skills needed by the person? and behind that idea to make things happen? Um, I think that, I think it, you know, nature or nurture, I don't know, I think it's a bit of both, honestly. I mean, I, I, for mine is, is nature and nurture. I know people who are nature and nailed it and people who are nurture, nurture only and nailed it. So I don't think it's... Um, I mean, it helps to be surrounded by entrepreneurs and to come, I think, or to put yourself into that kind of, um, I think who you surround yourself by can make a huge difference. Um, I think um, the one word, if I was to pick one word that sums up um, the, the key ingredient for being an entrepreneur, I think it's about being positive. I, I'm a huge believer 
um, in being positive, positive management, positive, clear communication, um, you know, being nice. I really believe in that sort of positivity drives success. And actually, whenever I've sat on, you know, other organisations or got involved and seen the sort of people I really admire um, operate, they actually are hugely positive. They're like, thank you, that was the best cup of tea. And actually, it's well done for smashing your numbers. Don't worry, it didn't quite work out, but you know what, we're going to do it next week. That positivity, I think, breeds positive energy. And I know that you can do the Alan Sugar way, which is, you know, it's more stick than carrot, but I'm, I'm all about the carrot. And... Um, I think people like to work in that environment. Uh, it's not to say that you can't be tough in many ways, or you know, but you can be fair. But I think positivity is absolutely imperative. And I think that entrepreneurs, honestly, are insanely positive. You know, they assume and believe in their project, despite years and years of not making money and putting their house on the line and risking everything and working all day and all night. You know, they're absolutely relentlessly positive um, and so I think that's the one thing you need I think that if you're too kind of cautious and you're a negative person that's often doesn't often thrive in that entrepreneurial sort of world because you, you've got to have an idea and you've got to say this is my idea who wants to back it believe in it buy it and by the way this is my idea who wants to work with me and you've got to be positive to kind of pull people through so I think that's the one thing that's really key. So presumably now, like every door opens because you've built this incredible brand. Everybody loves it. Everyone's with you on that journey and, and really inspired by it. When you were 18 years old and just starting out in, in this business world, what, what did you have to do to sort of get by and get through? And, and some of those things, I think, some of those lessons that you learn in the earlier stages um, can, can, be the, can be the best lessons to use taking forward, can't they? They can teach you so much. What, what were those like for you? I think you have to be quite dogged, actually. And I think that's, those are the really hard yards when, you know, it, it is, um, it is difficult. Um, and, you know, whether that's getting an order, getting a product made, um, getting paid for that product. I remember sitting in someone's shop and saying, I'm not leaving until you write me a check because you owe me money. Um, you know, you have to be really determined. Um, and often I think those, I remember Lord Young, who's my sort of business hero, he used to sort of say, there's nothing more dangerous than a, a young business with too much money, it needs to be difficult because those are the lessons you need to learn. So, I mean, you know, trying to, to persuade manufacturers to make my products when my quantities were tiny um, and and yet I needed a really special product to stand out, then trying to get an order, trying to persuade a customer to buy my product when they had no track record and it's much easier to buy a big known brand and then trying to persuade them to not pay me last and trying to, you know, it's just you're, you have to be... You know, you have to kind of learn to take the stomach punches. And to be honest, you, I still have that. I mean, it's, you know, it's still absolutely that now. You know, every day can be a stomach punch. And you just, that has to be your state of normal a bit. Um, so you have to get a bit sort of thick skinned about it. But I think you learn that in the early days. And, and I think every time you get a win, you build on those wins. And, um, and you, you kind of think, you know, what, I did it last time. I can do it again. And I think that, that sort of stays with you and, and you build your confidence. It's interesting. I remember we did an interview with uh, James Dyson and he was telling us that sort of 2,900 iterations of a product down the road. And finally, he, he sort of had the breakthrough and got where he needed to go. Similarly, we did an interview with uh, Rich Joseph of Joseph Joseph, who said the same thing. You know, this lady in John Lewis who happened to be a buyer that believed in what they were doing with a chopping board, <laughs> then transformed the nature of what he was doing. Has there been a moment like that for you where you've said, right, I am now, this is now a turning point we're up and running and, and we are heading in the right direction oh I mean there's so many turning points I mean from you know moving finding a, a manufacturer in the England who could just get going and deal with my small tiny quantities to then suddenly finding one in Italy that actually could do everything fully factored and I wasn't ordering the zips and the leather and everything myself um, to you know I remember ringing my mother from a, a phone box in Golden Square getting my first big order from the States my first export order um, you know opening your first shop and realizing that talking to it there's been so many I mean I've been in you know this business for so long so there's literally so many different points but um, I think that the point is you have to live with failure and it's hard because naturally you kind of want to skirt away from it because it, it you know it's, it's tough to take. Um, still now every day we've always got things that go wrong or you had a crisis yesterday something was stuck in customs that was key and we've got some massive orders coming in which is going to sell out it's going to be so exciting and the whole thing was there was a strike in Malpensa Airport and everything got soaked and it's all you know and still growing mold. I mean you, trust me there's you know you're fighting every single day, um, but I think that you learn that you will get through it. 
Um, and I think, fun if I had a, a, and I talk about this in, in the book, my, my eldest son wasn't very well at one point, he's now well, but it was kind of a really frightening time. And um, the one thing that taught me, and one of the, the most brilliant silver linings that we all refer to a lot about that time is it makes you realise that nothing matters that much and you will get through it somehow. You know, all of these problems, they are big dramas, but they will, it will always be sort of resolved and you will look back and it will be fine. So you just have to, in the moment, know that you will find, you know, you will naturally navigate through it as best you can uh, and make the best of the situation. You know, some things have better outcomes than others, but you will find a way. So you just have to kind of sit with that. But it's uncomfortable. Failure feels feels hard. We, none of us like failing. So you, it's quite easy to veer away from it, but you have to kind of lean into that a little bit, I think, probably, or at least learn to kind of... I realize it's part of the process. There's a lovely um, graph, actually, which is called the creative process, because with creative things, with all things, but with creative things, as you know, with your product, you, you're quite sort of on the line publicly. You know, it's my name, and I'm saying I like this. And when you're, when you're designing, you know, you start off going, I love this idea, it's amazing. And then you sort of, a few weeks in, you're like, it's actually quite hard, or it's too expensive, or it's not working. And then I don't like this idea. In fact, it's really bloody hard. And actually, I hate this idea. And then you're like, I actually hate myself. That's when you're at the bottom of the curve. And then you sort of work your way up going, you know what, maybe there's a way. Actually, I think I can find a solution. And then it's sort of, again, okay, then you look back a year later and go, actually, the product's completely great. <laughs> but at the time, you just can't see it. So I think that curve... I now know when I'm at the bottom that I will work my way up again. But there were many years when I, I hadn't learned that. So I think you, you, do, you do learn that you just have to kind of work through it and you, you will find a way. Did you ever wobble? I, ben and I had a bit of a wobble. Then we pulled ourselves back around a bit like the creative process you've just described about putting our name above the product and actually, you, and actually having that as a thing. Did, you, did, that ever make, did that ever make you feel uncomfortable? Did you ever wobble about that? Or did you think, no, I absolutely need to stand, stand, stand by this. This is who I am. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I started so young. I started my business at 18. So to be honest, I didn't really think about it then. Actually, I was, you know, just started a business and it sort of seemed like a, a brand name. And then, um, I mean, there are pros and cons, aren't there? You are sort of quite vulnerable, um, you know, and, um, and yeah, it's, it is what it is, honestly. So I have to say there's no point thinking about it because it's too late. <laughs> so I put my energy <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> I think more sensible sometimes to have something that isn't so, A, you're not so personally invested. And also, you know, if ever, if ever anyone, you know, decided to buy my company at some stage, which I don't want to sell, but, you know, you, it's your name. Do you know what I mean? It, that feels quite weird. And if it continues beyond me in any shape and form, it's sort of your name, which is, so that, that bit is a bit strange, but it's too late. So I'm not going to dwell on it really. <laughs> for that no, reason. forget it. Park it. Stupid question I should never have asked. Um, I was going to, I was going to ask you about, I, this is a curiosity piece. When I was reading your book, you talked about how when you were growing up, you, you well, obviously when you were growing up, you weren't a great cook, but you were talking about how your mum was an amazing cook and how every meal that was served with Brussels sprouts came accompanied with this chive, which was shaped in a bow. Is that your bow? Is that where your bow comes from? I think so much comes from my mother. She's, she's incredibly, um, creative and, um, she, uh, and I suppose she, I mean, she did, she used a bit of teaching, but she, she, in my sort of later years, she wasn't working so much. And, um, so in a way she poured all of her creativity into home. And sometimes I feel very guilty about that because I don't have the sort of spare time and I've had to sort of make peace with that. She had to put my creativity in other areas and we sort of find our way. But, um, she used to do these amazing, um, treasure hunts for birthdays. So it sort of made the present much more exciting. So you need to get the first clue and then you'd run and it would be in the laundry cupboard and you get the next clue and, and on you went. And the present at the end was always in a very sort of generously wrapped bow. I've always found things tied up with, with ribbons to be kind of exciting. Maybe for that reason, I'm not sure. Um, and I like the idea of the bow in a way comes from the idea of a trademark so you know if you get a silver knife you have a little trademark and you have the maker's initials and, and the year that it was it was um, made and there was a lovely old trademark I once saw that was this sort of other inscribed bow so I think a combination of all those things made it appealing family is a big a big huge huge part of your life of course it is you've got five children you're raising them alongside this this company that's going gangbusters how do you deal with this work-life balance that we always come back to the juggle like how do you make sure you're getting it more right than wrong 